Here we go. So that we can uh, share it. Um, we received an Orange Scott grant to, uh, to partner with the Center for Faith and Giving on looking at generosity and uh, 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 developing or sharing tools for uh, best practices with stewardship. Uh, this is our third of six webinars. Um, we'll have three more next year. Uh, they won't be on Saturdays. I think they alternate Tuesday and Thursday, but <clears throat> there'll be a mailing that comes out that will give a list of those dates and times. And I think the next one is in February. Our last one next year is in June. I think the middle one might be March or April. Um, and so what we're looking to do is to is to have uh, practice generosity. Uh, and so we are we are um, we're, we're looking to uh, create generosity amongst our, our congregation amounts, the people of our congregations, so that uh, we might uh, be better apt at recognizing how God has generously given to us. Uh, and how we can have generosity practices. And so today we're going to be looking at best financial practices. I want to bring Bruce back to the fourth stage, Bruce Bachauer, who's with the Center for Faith and Giving, who's been kind of spearheading, leading us through this piece. I want to remind you that he is available for a personal Zoom call. Uh, and, and if you're nice, he might even come and visit you. You give him a cookie and a some eggnog around Christmas time, he might come visit you and work with you and your congregations. And so uh, let us begin our, our webinar today. Uh, and so we're gonna go ahead and uh, call Bruce forward. Thank you, Bruce, for, for your work, your ministry, and how God has equipped you to equip others. Excuse me, Don, thank you so much still fighting the effects of a cough I've had for a couple of months. So I may uh, have to break for a moment here for extra coffee or water, but um, really glad to be with you this morning. We're going to talk about best financial practices uh, today and why those matter, why uh, it matters for us to think about um, creating an environment of trust in our congregations and the impact that that has on giving overall. So we might start with the, you know, why does this conversation even matter? Um, and uh, if, you, if you read this uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review, there are six particular areas where ethics around money arise in nonprofits. And they, some of them are not surprising to us in larger nonprofits, compensation, conflicts of interest, which impact all sizes of nonprofits, uh, how we do publications and, and, and how we solicit for money, financial integrity, how we invest money that we may be holding for future use or that has been given to us as legacy money, the way in which that money is, is invested and utilized, and accountability and strategic management. These are all things that they identify as issues for uh, concern and conversation in the nonprofit world. So that that's kind of why we're having that part of the conversation. And now I'm gonna <clears throat> try to bring up another thing on my screen that may look familiar to you. Um, I don't know how many of you, uh, because it's Kentucky, how many of you are close enough to the Louisville metro area to uh, have seen the news about a councilman who's uh, been, uh, being investigated for his ethics that have to do, we go down here, it has to do with a a, a, a grant of uh, post-COVID money from the city for $40 million to help bring a particular nonprofit uh, to work in the city of Louisville. And the day- hey, Bruce, I'm sorry, Bruce, are, are we looking at a different slide? Can you see the Louisville public media slide? No, sir. We, we're still on how do matters of financial ethics impact. Okay. Yeah. I show that you're looking at that. So let me see why you're not looking at that. Um, Sorry to interrupt you, but no, just... I'm glad you, you caught it. Let me see if I can 
I can bring it up. Um, can you see it now? No, sir. You might have to get out and come back in. Yeah. Well, I, I, the article basically just goes on to say that this councilman was uh, an advocate for bringing this uh, business to town. $40 million of the city's money went to help make that possible. And and he had voted on many and discussed many of the advantages of having this company come during the course of uh, the debate. Uh, and then the next day after the council voted to approve it, um, he announced that he was uh, taking a job that paid a quarter of a million dollars a year <laughs> with the company that the council <clears throat> had approved to bring to town. And we might suspect there could be a conflict of interest there. <laughs> That's how it lists itself out in the public arena. I had a, a another piece from the internet here that's in this slide that I apparently for some reason can't call up and share. It worked earlier, but that's how this is, you know. Um, the, the other one was uh, a staff member in a Methodist church in Indianapolis who embezzled over a three-year period about $500,000. Um, that is a reason to be concerned. Um, and uh, it's it's local enough. And the reality is, is that this kind of thing happens enough. I'm working with a congregation out on the West Coast. Same kind of deal, about the same amount of money over roughly the same period, three to five years. Uh, and the pastor was the one in this case who discovered uh, something wasn't right with the books and discovered that, oh my, um, there's a half a million dollars missing. Uh, I know in our small churches, we, we can't quite imagine what that would be like, but think about in a small congregation with a budget of $100,000, what it would mean if $75,000 was embezzled uh, over time and how that would have hampered your ministries, uh, how that breaks and violates the trust of people in the congregation relative to further giving. And what are the things we can do to prevent that kind of thing from happening? That's at least one part of our conversation. It really is a big deal. 30% of all churches globally have suffered from fraud or theft. And it's estimated that um, a large percentage go unreported. In 2020, that represented globally 68 billion dollars of funds that were misused and misappropriated. If you compare that to the total global missions money spent uh, by churches in 2019 is 60 billion, it eclipses that total investment in global mission. Um, and it's estimated that in 2025, that number will rise to 80 billion dollars. So it matters. Money conversations matter. As you have heard me say on more than one occasion, money is a spiritual issue. Uh, our relationship with money matters and the way we use our money matters. For the church, money is the fuel that <clears throat> makes mission possible. It provides for staff, facility resources to impact issues of human need. It is, uh, it's a critical component of what we need to, to make mission happen. We don't ask for money, really. We ask for the, the power to do mission uh, and to, to have impact in our community. It just happens to be that money is the gas in that tank. So it's important for us to be willing to talk about money, to be somewhat fluent in our conversations about money um, and to be proactive in the ways in which we use these resources. So some kind of overview things here that I think are important when we, when we just think about the budget itself. Unfortunately, so often in our churches this time of year, budget is the word we are most likely to use to talk about our financial needs. Well, you know, we need, we need to increase the budget or we have a deficit budget or we need more money uh, to pay the light bill or the pastor's salary. And we 
somehow divorce all of that from the conversations around ministry and mission. We need to remember that for the church, the budget is a planning tool for ministry. Uh, that's why we have a budget. Uh, and every church, if you think of it as a planning tool for ministry, every church, even the smallest congregation, should therefore have some kind of plan for <coughs> what we're going to do based on the mission and vision that God has given us to do. Um, in basic terms, of course, it represents resources we expect we'll receive. That's often why we do a, a, a pledge or commitment campaign. We look at history to see what we might anticipate for income. And then we look at the ways in which we're going to invest that into the work God's called us to do, which includes paying the pastor's salary and benefits, paying the utility bills so that the platform permission, <coughs> the church, is sustainable and able to function. But it, it should be driven by our mission and vision statement. What is it that we are about? Uh, and, and that's a way of reframing this conversation in a congregation that is so critically important. In congregations where we've gone on with Generosity Plus and worked on the ground for a period of time, that's probably been the most liberating thing for finance committees, is to reframe this conversation. And they actually now look forward to these discussions because it's not just about squeezing you know, more dollars from here or there to get to black ink. It's about what, what has God called us to do and how are we going to do it and how together do we collaboratively decide what that's going to be. Um, budgets are the <clears throat> theological documents, right? I mean, they represent our values. Where we put our money in our, home, our own life at home or where the church invests its money says a great deal about who we are and what we think matters. Uh, I always believe that mission uh, should be the first line item in every budget. We tend to list them alphabetically, you know, administration, um, or by, by the largest to the smallest, which means usually that's salaries and staff payments, with mission often being the smallest thing, which is unfortunate. Um, mission should be listed first as the reminder. This is what we're about. This is what we do. And hopefully that mission includes for your congregation, a regular contribution to Disciple Mission Fund and our covenantal relationship that supports all of the ministries across the life of the church, including the region. Um, the budget essentially in the process of building it displays the available alternatives for us to do mission and ministry and to evaluate past priorities and say, yes, those are still important, or revise those priorities and say, now these are things that we have done in the past, but our mission is calling us to go in a new direction. And so money moves from one program to another. Um, the, the budget establishes our priorities and it can eliminate old ones. Um, you know, there you may have some legacy items in your budgets that um, go back a long way and include things you don't do anymore. <laughs> um, the, 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 the CWF uh, T in April or something like that, you know, where we, well, we still carry that in the budget because it used to help raise money for camp, but we don't do that anymore. <clears throat> but we've never taken it out to say, yeah, this isn't how we go about this anymore. We do this differently. So legacy items can um, can be real helpful to remove. They can also help us get to a leaner budget. Uh, if, the, if we've had things in there that, that we're really not supporting anymore, but we've allocated dollars or we're just taking up space with line items, which makes the financial report harder to read. Um, th this is just sort of house cleaning uh, every year based on what our priorities are. Um, so... Uh, I like to talk about how do we frame this whole conversation, right? How does money become mission? I mean, that's ultimately what you should be telling people about on Sundays when you receive the offering. You know, this is what this is going to do. Um, so when you're building the budget and meeting in your finance term uh, committees uh, or, or however your budget is assembled with trustees or whoever, you know, What's the investment required to answer the calling? 
you know, to do this faithfully, what we believe God has called us to do, what does that mean? Again, mission, external mission should be a priority for us. It should be the first thing we talk about. Then the programs that we do internally that build up the congregation that help sustain and energize that mission, the staff salaries and benefits that go into making that possible, that help resource those areas, conversations, worship, education, representation in the community and these things that we've invested in, that that, that should be talked about um, and not simply seen as a cost center. Uh, and when we talk about narrative budgeting in detail uh, in, in one of our future sessions, we'll really talk about how to, to, to sort that out. Um, we talk about building and grounds, reminding ourselves that it's a platform for mission. I, I love the story. I, I was in, in a church in the Kansas City area many years ago, but not all that long ago because I was doing this job at the time. Um, and on that particular Sunday morning, they were wanting people to understand how the building, which was quite a large piece of property and quite significant investment of resources to keep it up, to keep it open. Um, a, a fella, three worship services I was in, it happened in all three of them. It was a different person each time. Uh, but the one that stuck with me was at, at the early service, this fella came forward at the offering time and said, hello, my name is Bob. And it was clear that nobody knew who Bob was. <laughs> and he said, I just have come this morning to thank you. Um, a, about 10 years ago, uh, I lost my family. I lost my job and I nearly lost my life. All I cared about was my next drink. And somebody brought me here to a meeting on Thursday nights. And, uh, and it took me a while to find, you know, my, my sobriety that I was off the wagon more than I was on it for a while, but eventually I found that serenity and, um, and I, I have a good job and I, I have a family and I'm trying to help other people find that. And, and I just want to thank you for making that space available. And then he walked out <laughs> And suddenly, you know, all that property expense wasn't just the cost of toilet paper and electricity and the custodial fees, right? It was the realization that our property is changing lives because of the way we're utilizing it <clears throat> and the kind of ministries that are taking place in our space. And we could talk about this then as, as missional, not simply property expense, Um and, and and when we again when we get into narrative budgets in detail, we spend a lot of time with how to help break those numbers out. But that's the kind of attitude we want to have when we build the budget um, <clears throat> as to how all these things help us be church. Not how they help keep the business open, right? Not how they keep the sanctuary just warm and you know and and a place for us to meet, which is also important. But it's more than that. At least it should be more than that. You know, we have large capital expenditures in some places to maintain buildings and property. And if we're only using them on Sunday morning for ourselves, I think we have some serious questions to ask ourselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, my sense of a church building is that it ought to be 24-7, so, you know, just every day of the year, something should be happening somewhere. Uh, to the to the fullest extent of a church's ability to support that. Um, and some of those things can be revenue producing. They can provide an income stream for you um, and, and certainly offset certain administrative costs and other things you have. But you begin to see how we're not just talking about, well, the light bill was $5,500 last year. <laughs> so we better add 6%, right? We, we, that, I mean, that's true, but... It, it's not what it's really about. Uh, and, and so we need to have that conversation with our folks. Now, it's important to know there are different kinds of budgets. Uh, we think that every church, regardless of how small, should have some kind of a line item budget. If you're paying a salary for, for a pastor, if you're paying for the grass to get cut and the snow to be removed, if you're, if you're you know, paying a light bill so that the pipes don't freeze um, or a gas bill, there's some planning that should go on for that, right? Uh, and and so that that's the line item budget. 
again, it should be based on what's God called us to do. It might cause us to ask some serious questions. <clears throat> but you need that line item budget for the treasurer to be able to uh, handle his or her fiduciary responsibility to make sure things get paid and that they get paid correctly and that we have a record of that and a way to report that. That's all a part of building an environment of trust. And again, it doesn't matter if you got 35 people or 350 people. Um, th this is just considered good practice. A zero-based budget <clears throat> can't do it every year because it, particularly in a, a medium to larger size church, it's a, it's a yeoman's task. But a zero-based budget is simply wipes out everything that isn't under contract for the next year. For the things that are fixed, that are contracts that you have to honor, you write those numbers in, but everything else is a zero. And so when you go back to the education committee, as an example, it's not, you know, well, here's what you spent last year. And the committee looks at it and said, well, let's add 5%. And that's what our budget will be next year. It's start with zero and say, okay, given the church's mission and given our part in that and what we've been called to do, what are the resources we need to do that well? So we we start from zero. It's again, it's kind of wiping out that legacy. <clears throat> you know, well, this is what we've always put in there. You may end up in the same place, but you need to ask the questions. You need to go through the process. Cash flow budget for nonprofits in particular, churches especially, can be really helpful, uh, especially in smaller, smaller churches where cash flow is an issue at certain times of the year. Because it's the acknowledgement that money doesn't come in or go out in 52 equal pieces, right? And so there's that big insurance bill that comes due in August, right? There's uh, There are quarterly expenses we have with taxes. There are whatever um, for our, for our <coughs> non-exempt personnel. We want to kind of map out historically for the last several years, where do the bumps in cash flow come? And that's so that we set aside when we're above the line that we're setting aside money for that bill that's coming in August when most churches are below the line in terms of income. You know, July, August, and even into September can be pretty rough months for churches. Um, and uh, because in a lot of communities, people are gone. Uh, and uh, if you're not using electronic giving and getting regular gifts from people that come, whether they're in church or not, um, cash flow can get strained and you want to be ready for those. It's a type of accrual accounting in a sense. Uh, you're accruing for upcoming expenses so that when they happen, you'll have enough and nobody has to panic. And the treasurer says, well, I can't meet payroll and pay the insurance. Which is it? Uh, <laughs> You know, we, that's a discussion. I can assure you, your pastor does not want to have you have it. <laughs> so it's it's preparing for it. Then I've already referred to the narrative budget and we have an uh, <laughs> entire webinar coming up dedicated to that, how to build a narrative budget and what's a part of that. Um, essentially what a narrative budget does is it takes the line item budget and breaks it across all of our priorities. And, uh, and so uh, I'm looking at Chuck, he's a pastor, so I can see him and I can say, so, you know, Chuck, how much time do you spend preparing for worship? How much time do you spend getting ready to teach a Sunday school class? How much time are you involved in meetings in the community around the food bank that we support or the, or the homeless shelter, those kinds of things. And we're going to break your salary and benefits out across those priorities of the church so that you're not a cost center. We actually see you as facilitating mission and ministry. We're going to do the same thing with our property, with all of our staff, with all of the things that we spend. We want to allocate those to what our priorities are when we tell our story. And then we're going to focus on impact. We're going to talk about what difference does it make and what happens or doesn't happen if we don't have the resources for that. Uh, and so that's the narrative <clears throat> style budget. Narrative is a is an in-house term, by the way. Uh, I sometimes see churches publish a narrative budget and says our narrative budget. Well, it's kind of a technical term. You're really better off to call it your mission and ministry budget uh, or um, a view of our missional priorities or something like that. There are better names for it than narrative. Narrative is just kind of our technical term as we classify these various budgets. Um, 
how we build the budget matters. Um, I there there's the old way that we used to do it, and in some churches maybe this still happens. And then there's a a, a slightly better way to do it. In the old way, I can remember in my first church out of seminary. Three trustees came into the boardroom, you know, with smoke and mist and said, behold, the budget. And everybody bowed down to the budget, right? This was it. They'd prepared it. They hadn't necessarily consulted with anybody. The three of them had sat down and decided, well, this is this is what things cost and we can't do raises or or uh, we're, we're going to cut mission or we're going to do whatever. And they just allocated the money however they saw fit and nobody discussed it. Uh, okay, that's the budget. Oh, thank you for preparing it. And all in favor say aye. Uh, and it was done. Uh, we, we think a much better way to build the budget is collaborative. And as I've already mentioned more than once, and you'll hear me say it again, that it's mission focused. So all of the constituencies in the church that are given trust to spend funds, like education, like the youth group, like whatever, missions committee, those folks come together to build the budget. They may work in their independent groups first, but then they come together to talk about, again, holding up that mission statement as that red thread through which we're seeing, you know, what's God called us to do and making decisions based on that. They collaboratively work uh, to establish the budget because sometimes we cannot do everything that we want to do. And rather than have cuts made in an arbitrary way, you can negotiate what those are. And somebody can say from their department, well, I think we could probably do with $1,500 less here, or $2,500 less there. This is a program we'd like to do, but it will hold because we see that worship really has to have this money uh, for us to maintain where we are now. And so we'll we'll concede that that, that money really needs to be over there rather than over here. Um, and, and that way the stakeholders are a part of it and they have more ownership in the process and they have more ownership than in the monitoring and management of it throughout the year, which again, we think is pretty important. Um, when we think about budgets and I say management, that that's part of what we do. That's our fiduciary responsibility as a board, as a member of the board in most nonprofits, uh, and I think this will hold up in Kentucky law as well, although you can designate trustees who have this ultimate fiduciary responsibility, and I know some of our churches do that. But ultimately, the board is supposed to have the fiduciary responsibility for the organization, meaning its financial solvency and the integrity of its financial reports. Um, and, and so the, the process the board should be doing and not just looking at the budget and hearing the treasurer say we're up or we're down, uh, we're in trouble or we can, you know, we can order new bulletins or whatever. Um, we want to really look at the variances and understand on both sides what might be impacting them. Uh, we think it's real important to have a, a three to five year, year over year, month over month picture of your finances, both on the income and expense side. So you can see what's normative. You know, I, every year in church I served, the end of August would come and the treasurer was just fit to be tied. Um, you know, we're going to have to fire the youth minister. We don't have enough money to pay the bills and yada, yada, yada. And, and we're going to go broke. And the reality is, is in August, it kind of looked that way, right? Except when you looked at a five-year history we were always 25% off the budget by the time we got to Labor Day. But by December, we always caught up. We always were within, a, you know, what I would call the playful margin of error for a budget <clears throat> when you're only off by a couple of percentage points one way or the other. Um, that, you know, we'd always make it up in part because if you looked at the cash flow budget, 30% of nonprofit income comes in the last two months of the year. That doesn't matter whether you're the Red Cross or the church, that's just a fact. Um, and, uh, and and so there's not necessarily a need to pay. If we were normally off 25% Labor Day and the treasurer in August, you know, that September report says, well, uh, we're only off 15%. That's, I mean, that's something to celebrate. Now, if he says we're off 35%, then that's something to be concerned about. 
Um, so the right kind of reaction to the to the circumstance requires information. Uh, it requires uh, knowledge. Numbers by themselves don't tell us very much at all. Uh, numbers set in context and numbers looked at and observed at over history tell us something. And uh, and so this is this is just kind of a best practice piece for any nonprofit, but something we need to learn to do better in the church. So if we have to make an adjustment, let's say we uh, we project we're going to be down 15 percent for the year at the mid-year point, and that's the point where we want to evaluate uh, the possibility of changes in the budget. Again, it shouldn't be the three trustees who, with you know, smoke and mirrors and mists, say, uh, you know, the, the, these are the cuts and we've made them. Um, it should be a collaborative process so that all the stakeholders again are at the table and can discern together how and where those cuts can best be made. And personnel should be included in those discussions. Uh, you know, it, it should not be made independent of. Uh, the personnel committee and their responsibility to care for our staff. Um, that that that's pretty important. We don't just say, well, we're going to have to go to halftime ministry. Sorry, uh, not without a lot of conversation, not without a lot of collaborative work within all departments of the church. Do we do we go to make a decision like that? And so policy should reflect this, right? It should name who builds the budget. Uh, how are those people chosen? How is the final budget adopted? Is there a process for appeal or amendment? You know, a lot of times by, by the time it gets to the congregation, if that's the last stop in a lot of our churches, it is. Um, you know, it, there it is. And, you know, people ask questions, but at the end of the day, we're just going to vote on it, right? And people's choice usually becomes yes or no, because there's not a process to to talk about, okay, we'll send this back for revision and we'll come back uh, and what that process might look like. Um, the other challenge is that when congregations as a whole get to vote on the whole budget, you end up with people often not having all the information on how decisions were made um, and therefore not really prepared to engage in meaningful uh, in-depth conversations about why the budget should be different. Somebody would just look at the evangelism budget and say, well, we haven't had a lot of new members in a while, so why is there only $1,000 in there? Which, by the way, might not be a bad question to ask. But, you know, they're just, they're not involved in the process of how elements put together in other ways in which, for example, the evangelism efforts might be being supported in other areas. Um, so we just, we think that's really important and we think that's important for regions and general ministries as well, that that really be clearly defined and that the more <laughs> stakeholders that you have involved, uh, the better uh, your, your chance of arriving at a reasonable solution and support for the budget is. Um, so th those are some kind of interesting pieces to this whole puzzle. Um, we also want to think about what happens, and, and policy on this is is helpful. What happens if we overexpend, right? Is there a ceiling or a cap that prevents the education department from going out and and blowing ten thousand dollars on children's worship and wonder when their budget only gave them a thousand dollars to do all of their work? Uh, and who's accountable? And 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 what do we do in that circumstance, right? Um, there are there boundaries, right, that protect the church and its assets from people who have some power to spend money, uh, but but who need to have some guardrails around them? Uh, what happens if we miss our targets? Uh, where's the authority for making those changes? And that really needs to be defined. Is there a process? I think churches are wise at the mid-year point to have a conversation leadership, financial leadership, the board, uh, about where we are, where we project we will be, uh, and, and whether or not <clears throat> we need to make adjustments. And sometimes, you know, there are good reasons why the budget is out of whack. I remember one year, the church I was serving, uh, our, we got to, to the mid-year point, our vacation Bible school came early in, in June, right after school, 
and we got the July report and education was like way overspent. Um, and that, I mean, that's kind of a problem, but the reason it was overspent wasn't that somebody had made a bad choice. It was that we'd had over a hundred kids register vacation Bible school that year. And we had to quickly get out and buy more resources and more snacks and more all of that stuff that, that pushed the price of that up. Now that was kind of a good problem to have. We still had an income problem we had to solve to match those expenses, but there was a really good reason why it was out of whack. Um, and, and so that that's an important part of that management piece is why are things the way they are? And then I have a note here about can paid employees vote on the budget? Um, I, I had this issue that I was the essentially the CEO of the congregation and responsible for executing all of the programmatic pieces of the church's life. <clears throat> Don't have a lot of authority, but I still had that responsibility. And I felt that that our staff should be able to vote on that plan for mission as a part because we had vo vote on other things in the board. Now, maybe you don't have a vote at the board meeting and that's fine, but we had vote. And I felt that that part of the budget, it was important for us to be able to be a part of the discussion. So we had voice and to be able to cast our vote that we felt this was representing the ministry that the church had been called to do. But it would be unethical for me to vote on my own salary. It would be unethical for me to participate in the personnel side of the budget um, be because that's a conflict of interest. Um, and, and so uh, we broke our budget into two pieces uh, so that staff could have input where it was appropriate and staff would shut up and, and recognize the conflict of interest where that existed. And so that's one way to consider doing that. <laughs> Again, when you're building that budget, it's all of the offerings, general operating, designated and restricted, and that restricted is really important. If you get a gift that's designated for a particular thing, you have to honor that. That is the law in every state. I know it's the law in Kentucky and I know it's the law in Indiana that donor intent has to be honored. If you do not honor that intent, um, you can find yourself in legal trouble and nobody wants to start a prison ministry from the inside that I know of. Uh, so you you want to be sure that you on it. I mean, if it's for the week of compassion offering, you can't use it for for general expenses. It has to go to the week of compassion offering. Um, that's just the way it is. If it, it, it if it's for chartreuse colored paint in the fellowship hall, you and you don't want chartreuse colored paint, then you got to negotiate with the donor <laughs> to to have some other color or some other use for the money, or you have to return the money. Um, that 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 designation is, is a restriction and we have to honor that. And that builds trust with people or breaks trust with people if you don't honor it. So that's again, part of this best practice piece. Are you gonna, do you have an endowment? Are you gonna receive money from your endowment? What's the, the, the best recommended draw from your endowment in any given year based on usually a three to five year cycle and average? of earnings. Um, and hey, you hey, policy. Uh, yes. I've, I've got a question for you and I, and I know it gets into your budgeting piece um, along with the uh, uh, piece on policy. Yeah. I've, I've often, I, I've been involved with churches that have the, uh, the building fund. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, account, right? And and I've seen that go kind of awry because some think the building fund is for new construction, <laughs> yeah, and some think the building fund is for current building maintenance. Yeah, and here again, Don, saying what we mean and when we create the fund, naming specifically what the fund is for, really helps clear that up. And we for people who want a maintenance fund, we recommend a non-reverting maintenance fund. That's what you call it. There's money goes out of the budget every year, plus whatever people designate for that. 
that's designed to repave the parking lot, that's designed to put a new roof on, that's designed to fix the air conditioner, that does all of those things. Um, and that's separate from a building fund that's for capital improvement uh, and new construction. Um, and, and one of the ways this gets kind of muddled is that you'll do a building campaign and maybe you'll oversubscribe it, right? You've done a, a, a you've done something, uh, some kind of capital campaign, you've oversubscribed it and there's money left over. So what happens to that money? Well, we recommend upfront when you begin the campaign, you'll state that any monies in excess will be used for maintenance of the new facility, right? So it's there. Um, and, and we've already got a little nest egg now to, to replace the roof in 20 years, right? We've already got, you know, to repaint the fellowship hall or refinish the floor in five years. You know, we've got the money already set aside for that. But when it's not clear, then then you can have people come and say, well, I gave my money to the building fund. Why, why, why are you using it to pay the pastor's salary, <laughs> right? Or why are you using it to put, put whatever? Um, so clarity, when we name these funds, is really important. What's the purpose? We have an endowment fund. The purpose is to do what, right? We have a building fund. The purpose is to do what? Um, and that that's recorded and people know where to find it. <laughs> you know, one of the problems we often run into is, well, that happened 25 years ago and we don't have those records anymore. <laughs> that That's a problem. <laughs> Um, you know, we keep, keep, keep your minutes from your board meetings. They, they are to some extent legal documents that can be very useful to you in the future. So does that help answer your question then? So when you're looking at all that income, what's our endowment going to be if we have it? Do we have user fees, right? This gets a little tricky with taxes and, and what we call, um, UBIT, which is unrelated business income. And churches with daycares and other kinds of things that make money for them for re retail space, if you were the renting it out and as a lease agreement can get a little dicey if it's not clearly understood that what you're doing is a ministry of the church. Uh, and, and we recommend that you get with a nonprofit tax attorney if you have this kind of a setup to be sure that you are structured properly because the IRS, while you're a nonprofit, if you have unrelated business income while you're running that nonprofit, um, that's taxable. And they take a dim view if you don't pay those taxes. So, and th these are things I never learned in seminary. I, you know, as good as my seminary education was, these were conversations we never had. Um, and, and they do kind of matter to be sure that we're protecting the church uh, and its assets and its people. So we're gonna, we're gonna take all that income transfer from savings. Sometimes that's how we balance a budget. We have a quote rainy day fund <laughs> and we're building the 2024 budget and, and, and it's raining outside, right? We've, we've had a decrease in giving. We, we have missional priorities that we wanna meet. And we're going to develop a plan, and it's very clear that we're going to be accountable for that plan to make up the difference. But in the meantime, we're going to fund part of the budget with a transfer from our reserves. Um, and, and that's a whole other question of policy is how much reserve should we have on hand? Um, you know, I, I know churches whose rainy day fund is set for a hurricane, <laughs> Right. They, they got four times their annual budget sitting in a savings account nobody wants to touch, but they can't pay their pastor. That's a problem. <laughs> that's, a, that's an issue. We tend to think that 120 days maximum of full operating is enough for a reserve fund. Because even in COVID, and think about how awful COVID was and, and how it changed life for us in every way in the church, we did not go six months without receiving any income, right? We pretty quickly figured out how to get checks and how to do electronic giving. And, how, you know, we weren't in person meeting to receive money through an offering plate, but we figured out pretty quickly and folks believed in the importance of supporting 
that they responded very well. It's interesting, 2020 was actually a very generous year in the life of the church, as people who could do so gave very generously because they believed that this mattered and they wanted to see us through this time. So you wouldn't have used 120 days in most congregations of total asset needs, of income needs, even in COVID. And that's about the worst thing I've seen. Right. Short of nuclear war, which I pray to God we'll never face, it's pretty hard to imagine a scenario where we would go 120 days without somebody giving us a dime. Um, so 120 days is plenty. I tend to leave more toward 90. And so then the what do we do with the rest? And what do we do with what we have? That 90 days should not be sitting uh, in the checking account earning, you know, a half of a half percent of interest. <laughs> You know, you've got places where you can invest that even in the life of the church. You, you've you got um, church extension as a place where you can put money you might need short term and invest that supports churches building needs and loans and pays a pretty decent rate of interest. Um, they just recently had a thing, I think it was 6% for 18 months um, on a $25,000 investment. That's not bad. And the money's working for you then. Um, CDs have gotten better, but there was a time not all that long ago where, you know, you were locking things into five-year CDs. That was really almost financial malfeasance. You weren't allowing the church's money to work, right? So how we craft policies around things and decisions we make around this matters. These are details, again, that we most often don't get in seminary, uh, but, but they're kind of important. Um, you may have grant income that you're going to build into your budget. This becomes very important in terms of separating that money out with separate accounting for expenses and income, <clears throat> because most granting agencies will expect a report of what you did with their money. What did it cost to run the program? What was the budget? What did they agree to give you? How much did you use? What were the results? And so a separate accounting for that grant money is pretty important. Um, I, I, my heart is with staff and personnel. And so for the region and for general ministries, for pastors, how do we determine a minister's salary? <laughs> this, this falls into the line of best practices. Um, when we're going to evaluate the pastor's salary for next year, there are always two components that should be talked about. One is a cost of living raise, and one is a merit raise. Um, and we may not be able to do one or both of those things in certain years. I, I get that. I know that's important. But I recommend that churches have as a matter of policy that the staff will automatically receive a cost of living raise annually. And you can pick whatever index. The easiest one is the Social Security Index, which is the broad average uh, across the country. Now, if you live in New York City or Los Angeles or Chicago, you might want to choose a different index. But we recommend that it be there for this reason. And that is that the church may not be able to pay it, but it at least has to discuss it. It at least, there has to be some ownership within the board and preferably within the wider congregation, but certainly within the board, not just the personnel committee of why we are not giving a cost of living raise. And it, it's not enough to just say, well, I didn't get one at work. You know, that <laughs> we're the church and we're supposed to be holding out a better example for the world, right? and the care for one another and the, the appropriate uh, compensation for our staff says a lot about us and what we believe is important. Um, and, and so having that in, the, in your policy annually is in the building of your budget, at least makes you talk about it. And if there's gonna be a merit raise <clears throat> or not, again, there should be some meaningful evaluation of the staff's work so that there's a basis for giving or not giving, or being able to say we would like to do 3% merit, but the budget simply does not allow us to do that this year. 
one of the things you can put in there is but if there's if there's money at the end of the year then more than we anticipated we'd like to revisit a retroactive raise to support the staff that this is what we desire to do this is what we think is is the right thing to do but we can't do it now um but if we're able to do it later in the year we want to do that and, and it's in writing right it's a decision that you've made to do uh the board's voted on it um and let me tell you, your staff, custodian, secretary, pastor, doesn't matter, <clears throat> choir director, will feel cared for if you at least talk about these things and don't just ignore them. You know, it, it, again, it may be you're not always able to do them, but per, that personnel piece is really important. What we say about the people who we've called to serve us and the work we've asked them to do. And let me tell you, folks, right now, pastoring is hard. Maybe harder than it's ever been. Um, and and I think that, that we need to be attentive to that. We have folks leaving ministry nationwide across all denominations at an alarming rate. Um, and if we want good pastors, qualified pastors, we have to understand our obligation and responsibility to care for those people uh, and to provide a living wage for them. That package is usually broken, and I'm just giving this as a touchstone for some who may not realize, clergy pay taxes. <laughs> There's some myth out there that clergy don't pay taxes. We do pay taxes. The tax we don't pay is the, the federal income tax on the equivalent of our housing allowance. But we pay Social Security and Medicare tax on that at the self-employed rate. Uh, of 15.34%. Clergy <laughs> um, pay plenty of taxes. Uh, all of it is self-employed at that rate. Um, you structure your pastor's salary within the budget and make some statements at year end for the next year's budget that are meaningful to your clergy for tax breaks. Stating the housing allowance. Now it's up to the pastor to determine what that is. Uh, they, we're, we're, I'm not going to micromanage our pastors, you know, what he or she thinks that should be. There are guidelines for that and they're provided. They, it's up to them to follow them, but they declare what that is. And then we vote to declare that that's what that is in the year's coming budget. Uh, that then allows them to not pay the, the, the federal income tax on that amount. They shouldn't be paying taxes, um, on, on their expenses. That should be broken out and understood separately, that, that the expenses they encounter to do their ministry, mileage and taking people out to lunch and buying magic markers and all those kinds of things shouldn't be coming out of their taxable income. We should be designated an area of expense that's highly accounted for. We're gonna do an example of that here in just a minute. Um, that that um, makes it possible right, for the, our clergy to get the best advantage available to them by law. This isn't to cheat anybody out of anything. This is simply what the law provides and makes available. And, and that salary should be broken down in the budget in ways that help people understand what we're really paying the pastor, uh, which doesn't really end up being as much as we think we are. I can remember I had a fellow in my one congregation who looked at, because my total package was shown, in salary and it wasn't all broken down you know we we pay you a lot he wanted to be on personnel he was a union guy and he'd been always sitting on the other side of the table he wanted to sit on the management side of the table uh and he didn't understand that you know he got all of his dental and his vision and his health benefits and a great pension and all of that was a part of his salary that he never saw in his paycheck uh, and, uh, and so by breaking these things out, we help people begin to understand what we're really paying our pastor, <laughs> what we're really asking them to live on. Uh, and again, it provides the pastor with some certain tax benefits. Um, are there any questions on that? I'm, I'm going to get here to a point where we're going to do something much more interesting than listen to me. Um, but this is kind of a lot of stuff up front. Okay, so good policy builds trust, establishes uniform procedures, 
It meets our fiduciary responsibilities, it protects our leaders, and it protects our assets. That's essentially the summary of all of that that we talked about. <clears throat> and I could give you a list, probably we'll send it to Don, of 40 questions your church ought to be able to answer about money and about things for which you ought to have some stated policy. Um, and including ways to protect your congregation from getting steeplejacked, which if we have time, we'll talk about at the end of our time today. Um, so those areas that we're going to look at, and then we're going to do, do a, a fun little piece here. Uh, we want to talk about money handling. We want to talk about how we report, how we build our budget, how we treat our staff, when we audit which every church at some point should be doing some kind of an audit. Um, how we handle legacy gifts, that's a whole separate area of policy and Christian Church Foundation can help you build that in ways that are meaningful and life-giving to your church. How we receive gifts and acknowledge those. How we refuse gifts that we don't want, like for that chartreuse paint in the fellowship hall, right? how we refuse a, a gift of income we may not want. Uh, pastor, we've got a piece of property down in Tennessee. We would just love to donate to the church. Now, it's an EPA super fun site, but we know that won't bother you at all. <laughs> we just would love to give this to the congregation. Can you write us a tax receipt for that? Um, there are some gifts you don't want, right? How do you retire gifts? Um how many more key, how many more 86 uh, keyed pianos do you need in, in your education wing or three legged couches in the youth room, right? <laughs> and when do you retire something? You know, I, I, this true story, I visited a church that had three lights on the piano. Each one had a little plaque on it about who it had been given from and in memory of whom, and not one of them worked. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have a way to retire it. They didn't know what they should do with it, so they just left them, right? Each time they bought a new light to replace the one that didn't work. <laughs> you know, it's okay to retire a gift, and we can have a process for that. Congregation I was in retired a piano that, you know, had been given to the church in the 1920s, and at the time, it was a hell of a piano. It was not a great piano in 1985. <laughs> it couldn't hold a tune for a week. So we developed liturgy to retire that gift as we were raising money to get a new one. Uh, and, and it left the sanctuary, you know, the next Sunday it wasn't there, but we acknowledged it. We acknowledged the joy. We, we had to happen to know where the original gift came from. We could acknowledge that and celebrate that and all the carols and Easter resurrection hymns and all the great things that had happened. And now it was time for its service to end. <laughs> and the next week, it wasn't there. <laughs> but it didn't just disappear because that can make people mad, <laughs> right? So how we think about all of this, I know it's a lot of detail stuff, but it really kind of matters. So I'm going to try, we'll see here if I can do this, to do these two case studies with us. These are studies I actually use in my class at um, LTS. And um, I'm going to see if I can share screen again. Let's see here. Have to get back into, there we are. And Close that. Y'all are still there, right? Okay. Let's see if I can share the screen. Here we go. So how do these things in real life apply? These Both of these examples, I must give credit where credit is due. Can you see these on the screen now? Came from Todd Adams about, I don't know, 12 years ago or so when we were working together on an event out in Arizona. And these were case case studies. They're made up, but but they're they, these are things that really do happen uh, <clears throat> for the group to discuss. We're talking about the importance of financial practice and policy. So, um, you know, you can make this bigger on your screen if you tap on it and, and 
you can you can make it bigger to see it because my voice is a little weak. Um, can I ask somebody to read this for us and then we're going to talk about it? I'll read it. Thanks, Chuck. It is a typical Sunday morning at First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Always Sunny, Arizona. Reverends William and Wildcat have planned an insp inspiring worship service. Being the first Sunday after Labor Day, all the families have returned from summer vacation and settled into their normal routines. The early service has returned to its pre-summer worship attendance of 125. The late service is overly full today with almost 180. All seems to be running like a typical Sunday. The choir was in tune. The pieces of the service were connected in a very inspiring manner. At the close of the early service, Deacon Denny noticed that the offering collection from 8.30 is still on the communion table. He picks up the trays, carries it over to the office, setting the trays on the desk, he begins looking for an envelope or bank bag. Finally, finding one in the storage room, he takes the offering and places it in the treasurer's box for counting after the second service. During the late service, the offering is received and the collection plates are given to the head usher. The head usher then walks the collection plates over to the office and sets them on the desk while she looks for the bank bag. Finding the bank bag with the early service offering, she places the offering in the bag and returns it to the treasurer's box. After lunch on Sunday, Mrs. Lee, who has served as the financial secretary for 21 years, counts the offering and prepares the bank deposit. The bank deposit is then left in the secretary's desk drawer for her deposit on Monday morning. On Monday morning, the janitor begins his normal cleaning duties in the sanctuary. He finds the choir's offering plate under the last chair in the choir loft. The janitor walks the plate over the office. Noticing that it is all cash, the se secretary simply opens the bank bag, modifies the deposit slip before heading out to the bank. Treasurer Anderson comes in on Wednesday while his wife rehearses with the choir, he takes the deposit slip from the bank bag and enters the amount into checking account register. Identify each of the issues relating to internal control in the scenario and what should be done to address them. What policies or practices could prevent this and why is that important? And excuse me for a minute, Stephen, I'm in a meeting right now, buddy. <laughs> I have seen offering plates unattended in churches on more than one occasion. I have seen single individuals walking with plates. Uh, I have I have seen all of this in in one place or another and experienced some of it in in my churches until we corrected it. So this, while it seems ridiculous, <laughs> and maybe it doesn't, maybe it seems like normal at your church. Uh, let's talk about what are the issues here? What could possibly go wrong? Uh, not enough transparency. Okay, how? Well, for one, there's a reason why our church camp has a two-on-one policy with kids. Okay, same with money. Um, you got to have some accountability in there, and accountability creates that transparency needed. Unfortunately, with cash, there's always going to be that concern. Right. And so uh, one of the reasons why uh, if someone ever hands me cash, per se, uh, for something, I ask somebody nearby, hey, can you witness this for me? You know, and I do it tongue in cheeky as a joke and everyone laughs, but internally the leadership knows why I do that right. because I don't want someone to question whatever happened to this amount because sometimes people hand me things, you know, because they want to do it in secret as the Bible says, and I have to create that paper trail for lack of a better expression symbolically to uh, make sure there's, you know, no questions. All these things, there's no uh, witness other than God. So that's first place we would start is, is that there's nothing, uh, there's no point at which there's a policy that's being followed. I mean, the only thing worse than not having a policy is having a policy and not following it. Um, <laughs> but that it requires two people to be involved in the counting of money at all times. And Excuse me, by the way, they shouldn't be related by blood or marriage. Husband and wife doesn't count as two. Um, another way to deal with the cash issue when you have counting teams like this is to rotate the teams and somewhat randomly. 
so that I don't always count with Bill and Bill and I decide, hey, you know, an extra 20 bucks to go to out to lunch afterward would be nice. Let's help ourselves. And Bill and I do it and turn it in. Uh, and, and, you know, we get a regular routine for that. We've actually seen that happen in counting teams. So you, it's, it's not just enough to say two people and not married, but it's important to rotate those teams. So it isn't always the same two people together. So that's one thing you've uncovered, which is brilliant. What else is, what else is wrong here? We've got too many people trying to be helpful. And sometimes being helpful creates a bigger mess than it's worth. Uh, the two services should be two separate incomes for statistical people, but they they grab the bank bag, put the bank bag where they found them. You know, there's just there's just too much people trying to be helpful, causing a bigger mess of concern. Well, and again, when we get to the counting, we don't have a way for each service to verify the count, and we're not doing any recording. The recording is really important um that the money is counted and we record how much we got in checks how much we got in you know fives tens twenties and quarters and that's part of the cash report that that all goes in and it's duplicated right um this sunday service we got this income from these people i mean you list you're really supposed to list checks uh and it's duplicated one goes to the financial secretary who needs it to record and credit uh to the people who've given the money and cash is more difficult but we deal with cash separately but that should be recorded the other copy should be filed off-site uh for future audit and if it's if it's ever needed there's lots of records churches should have duplicates of that should be off-site um because uh things happen tornadoes floods uh fires <laughs> And if you only have one copy of the records in one place, you risk losing all of that information. Uh, and we're dealing with, in some of this, you know, we're dealing with people's tax life <laughs> and they would not take kindly to the church should the IRS raise questions, not being able to provide them the information that they need. Um, so there's that duplicate piece is a little bit of a sidebar here to get it another element of this that we tend not to think about um that that it's in a separate location so the financial secretary gets the breakdown the treasurer gets the total and anything that's designated and all of that is written out and two people sign off on it um what what else went wrong aside from deacon denny being on his own here i mean the the money is unattended right I was I was just about to say that the security um, lacks luster and it sounds like that's a really good way to, you know, if it's a bigger church, lose several thousands of dollars in one sitting. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, left alone on the desk while he goes into the storage room to find a bag. Uh, the offering plate, nobody checked after worship to be sure that all the plates were accounted for. Here's the choir's plate sitting back there uh it's been unattended for you know 48 hours almost or certainly 24 hours and then the poor custodian what's he supposed to do you know at that point he can go find somebody to come help him uh and verify you know hey i can see this here but there was nobody with him initially when he found it <laughs> that's not fair to him mm -hmm. right so accounting for all the offering plates seems pretty important to me as a way of verifying the count and security. Um, any comments about Mrs. Lee, who's been the financial secretary for 21 years in her process? Any possible concerns about that? There's always going to be concerns, but on the flip side, if she's been there for 21 years, she obviously is trusted. So confrontation has to be handled very delicately if there are concerns in the changing her routines and protocol. That's right. We would not have hired her or called her to that job. We would not annually or biannually elect her to that job if we didn't trust her. But trust is not an internal control. Um, and I mean, she could be the Pope, right? Well, she can't be the Pope at this point, but you know, we could be talking about the holiest person we know, 
Um, and it's still not an internal control. Uh, and that's why we audit. That's why we duplicate effort. Nobody's alone. Um, and there's another potential problem here is that my guess is that if Mrs. Lee has been doing this for 21 years, there might not be anybody else who knows how to do it. So what happens if Mrs. Lee dies, has a stroke, gets mad and leaves the church? I mean, there's all kinds of things that can happen. Uh, and there's nobody trained. There's no backup person to do this work. We have a policy called the no one rule. The, new, the church is beholden to no one person for any a priori uh, information. That doesn't mean it, it. It doesn't mean if it's how to unjam the copy machine or program the thermostat in the sanctuary, or the combination to the safe. You are never beholden to one person for anything. That breeds resentment on their part because they can never go away. Right. Uh, it, it builds the opportunity for the concentration of power and control that cannot always be healthy for congregations um, because they can't do it without me, <clears throat> right? Um, and that can that can get leveraged in lots of unhealthy ways. Um, but but most importantly, that if if something happened, it's happened to a church I was consulting with up in Ohio. You know, the the financial secretary became critically ill. And no one else had been doing the work for a long period of time. And nobody knew what to do on that Sunday morning. She got sick on Saturday night. What do we do? Nobody knew. Now they do. Now they have a policy. <laughs> and that's all spelled out. And they have an assistant financial secretary who knows how to do the work. And that alleviates the need to not let this person go on vacation, right? They want to be gone for a couple of weeks. They can do that. They get sick and really shouldn't be at church. They don't have to show up. Because there's somebody else to call and come in and do the work. Um, and that long time investment in any office is not in the long term best interest of the church. Um, Don, I hear you wanting to say something there. You're yeah, leaving. Uh, I, 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 I don't under. I don't know about the security of her desk drawer. Exactly. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it. it and then leaving it for Monday morning. Most banks have an overnight depository that you can drop it in. There's no such, I mean, I don't see whether it was a bag with a lock and key on it, mm -hmm. although that can be torn into, but it takes more effort. Right. Well, it can just be carried away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how safe her drawer is and them depositing it on Monday morning as opposed to Sunday afternoon with all the other internal controls being in place. Absolutely right. And most desk drawers can be open with a letter opener. <laughs> so even if it's locked, is that really the most secure place? In larger congregations where there's bigger sums of money, we generally think that not only should they de be deposited as soon as possible, but that no one ever goes to the bank alone with them. Mm -hmm. Um and that's particularly true in a lot of our congregations where that is 85 year old Aunt Bertha, you know, driving her Rambler American 220 still to get to the bank. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's just, that's not safe for her. That's not in her best interest or the church's best interest that somebody else accompany uh, when there's larger sums of money that, that feels important. Or when we're in, in our churches are in neighborhoods where, um, just being alone in general uh, is is not always desirable. Um, so uh, I, I think that's a that's a piece to consider here. Also, anything else in here? I mean, she should not have been able to just open up the bag and change the deposit slip. Right, right, right. right. Again, there, there needed to be two people involved in that. So you can imagine the kind of policies that you'd write. They don't have to be 18 pages long, right? That just state, this is how we deal with the morning offering. This is what we do. This is how it's handled. Um, and um, so, yeah. Okay. I had, we were going till noon, Don. Thank you for that uh, reminder that we're done at 1130. Um, so let me... Um, 
stop that. Well, I, I, there's one other one I want to do here. Um, this is a short one, but I, I think it's important. Are you able to see that? Probably not. Okay, let me. This one won't take as long. Share screen. Um, pastor Diamondback serves a medium-sized congregation in the southern town of Cardinal, Arizona. She'd been pastor for 30 years. God love her. Over the years, the church has rotated different people as treasurer and financial secretary. The congregation has a five-year term limit on all financial positions. Good policy. During this time, she's developed a pattern of submitting her expenses to the church for reimbursement by photocopying her credit card statement, coding the expenses, and having them having them cut a check. Admittedly, she does not like to keep up with receipts and says they're often confused with her personal expenses or thrown away. She feels that the church should trust her as the pastor to submit appropriate expenses for reimbursement. She also doesn't like to track mileage on her vehicle and just estimates for the month how many times she's driven to the hospital or other church-related activities. What's wrong with this picture? And what steps should be taken to correct the situation? And is the pastor open to tax liability? Mm -hmm. Who wants to take a shot at this one? <laughs> I'd like to think it's pretty obvious. Just know all around. Yeah. <laughs> Just know all around. Absolutely. Uh, hey, say more, Stephanie. Well, I was thinking um, like just my own personal habits that I developed on my own because admittedly my church doesn't have policies for me at all when it comes to any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I kind of wrote my own policy and said for mileage, I'm going to use the Google Maps thing because I do sometimes forget to actually track the odometer. Right. Um, so it's just standard. I use the Google Maps um, if I have to go back and look it up. And what I don't report is my responsibility. Um, I'm not going to put that on the church and I'm not going to do it more than, you know, two weeks after my trip or two weeks after the month. Um, and then, yeah, she's she's open to potential tax liability because uh, if she's not reporting her expenses, then she's having to pay taxes on things that she doesn't need to be paying taxes on and vice versa, you know, so it's just no all around. She needs to be more financially aware of her own situation. The um, the IRS requires you document your mileage. Now there's a bunch of apps now that do that. My wife has a an app she pays a an annual fee for. It's not terribly expensive for her real estate work. And it tracks all of her mileage. And it makes it real easy for her to generate a report when it's tax time as to how much miles she spent for business. Um, and uh, those kinds of things are available. When I was at First Christian Jeffersonville, the treasurer gave me a, a sheet <laughs> that came out of the treasurer's handbook, uh, the handbook for treasurers that we still have, hadn't been updated since 2016, but it is on the website and in Spanish, uh, of how you should report your mileage. And it does want odometer readings to keep the IRS happy. <laughs> um, there should be a time limit for how late you can expense something. For OGMP, I've got 30 days, you know, I, that's what I got. I got 30 days. At the end of 30 days, I got to turn everything in and I got to be, have a receipt for everything or I have an affidavit form I sign if a receipt has been lost um, that that essentially I'm swearing an oath that this really was an expense for which I don't have a receipt. Um, sometimes one isn't given. Uh, and, and sometimes you throw it out in the food bag when you're in the airport running between airplanes and you didn't get it in your pocket. That happens. Um, and it's kind of obvious, you know, I was traveling that day and I was, you know, you can kind of piece it together and nobody really questions it, but, um, and I'm not allowed to buy alcohol, you know, and, and so my, my food receipts, my restaurant receipts all have to be the itemized receipt, not just the total that I paid with the tip. It's everything that was bought, you know, the appetizer, the whatever is listed. 
um, because I'm accountable to that. The, the office says we won't pay for you to have a, a glass of wine at dinner. We don't mind if you do, but that's separate. That's on you. <clears throat> and so all of that has to be documented. I might regret I might regret saying this, but this little paragraph hit close to home. I might not have 30 years, but I have 15 years. <laughs> same congregation. And that phrase developed a pattern yep. really close to home. Because yep. really, depending upon who the current treasurer or financial secretary is, determines the pattern I develop that particular two-year period of time. Right. Because all of them have their own preferences as to what they want. And then let's be honest, the mileage thing is very blurry because I commute to my rural setting. A lot of times I'll stop at a hospital on the way to or on the way from, you know, there, and then sometimes I got to throw in there, pick up the boys from school. So I have incorporated the Google Maps. I believe, Stephanie, you're the one who said that a few moments ago. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. But, you know, a lot of the stuff has been remedied because of online bill pay. Right. Uh, a lot of us have gotten in the habit of using a separate credit card for church expenses or gas or whatever. And when you develop all these little kind of like my wisecrack about asking for a witness, can I have a witness when someone hands me cash? You know, we develop little we call well, we call them life hacks now in, in my generation. But but right. I'm on meeting, in a meeting, buddy. Uh, but it that phrase develop a pattern. It's inevitable. And it leaves my colleagues and I've very, very, very vulnerable because the church is not keeping up with culture. Right. And uh, so we have to be very intentional about having a conversation with whoever is the person that you submit these uh, reports to. Um, otherwise, you know, you have uncensored conversations in a parking lot after a board meeting, you know, and I, I just, that's my way of saying, you know, I think it's no accident that you got a three to five year rotation of staff at most churches. Right. You know, and, and I, I've, I've, I've lived it the past 15 years because how I do things now is not the same as it was three years ago, five years ago, eight years. I mean, it changes, uh, you know, always because of who is the new elected leadership because of the same policies to protect us. So you have to develop a pattern. And that, right. that scares me because that, that leaves a lot of vulnerability. Yeah, and, and so that's why having a consistent policy, then it doesn't matter who the treasurer is, you both have to abide by it, right? This is what the church says we'll do. I will do expense reports, you know, every 30 days, you know, closed on the 30th, reported by the 15th or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I'll provide all receipts and I'll provide all mileage information, Um that 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 that's just the, the the practice. Then the treasurer doesn't say, "I don't need to see that." You know, no the treasurer does need to see it, and it needs to be filed away. Particularly for you on the tax side, uh, that 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 should be in the church's records. And I, I always kept a record, still do, of my expense reports, so that if anybody comes back to question something, I've got copies of the receipts. I've got the dates in which it occurred. Um, so We're, that yes. I, I think that that's why uh, the pastor has to know some of these things and be prepared because some congregations may not. That's right. They may have a practice because they've done it that way for the last 30 years too. Yep. And then sometimes it becomes hard, but the pastor has to ethically do that and help lead the congregation into the into creating those policies, yeah. um, not just for themselves, but for others as well. So, yeah. so, so I think that we, we have to, it's a fine line we have to draw. Yeah. Because like I said, some congregations, well, you're just the pastor. We've been doing this policy. And so you have to help still craft it, help lead the congregation into those practices that are good, whether you're, not just for you, but for whoever may come after you as well. There's a book it's that I think is yeah, difficult. It is. There's a book I recommend that all congregations should have in their library uh, that the church treasurer and finance team should be aware of, that the pastor should be aware of. It's it's called Church Finance, <laughs> oddly enough, <laughs> by Michael Batts, B-A-T-T-S, 
who is a CPA, uh, and he's with the um, the Evangelical Conference on Financial Accountability. I mean, it's I mean that it's that's a really good organization, uh, and uh, he produced this book. It's now has a second edition because there've been some changes in tax law, and they keep up with that pretty well. Um, and uh, it has examples of all of these kinds of policies, right? Um, internal controls and and the difference in audits and and financial reviews and compilations and why you might need one and not another. Um, uh, you know, we say, oh, we can't afford an audit. Well, for many of our small congregations, that's probably true, particularly because they don't keep records well, <laughs> and an accountant would just lose their mind trying to to give you any veracity on the financial reports, any statement of of their truth. Uh, but you can internal audit. Uh, a group of small churches in Northwest Ohio every every February gets together, their financial secretaries, treasurers, and chairman of their finance team, and they bring their books. And if there's, I think it's a Methodist, a UCC, and a disciple or a Presbyterian, I don't know, but they just, they sit at a table and they pass the books to the left. <laughs> Bruce, what 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 I'll ask you is that as you send this uh, um, uh, uh, PowerPoint to me, mm -hmm. that I'm going to send to all the participants. In the in the, if you could also do those forty questions, I will. Then also maybe give a few books or a few uh, resources that I can send to this group as well, so that they will have that as well for 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 themselves. Glad to do that and. The, um, the the PowerPoint's going to have a lot more slides in it than you saw because I I had another thirty minutes worth of material that um, my bad um, it we we need to be you know moving toward completion. <laughs> what I will say is that these things matter. Some of them seem small and insignificant, but we need an environment of trust in order to create a culture of generosity. And if we don't report well, if we're not transparent, if we don't show signs that we're caring for people's assets that they share with us to do ministry admission, and they're not utilized in the way in which they've given them, <clears throat> they will be less generous or not generous at all. So you, you just want to do that. You want to protect your people. The whole purpose of an audit is not because we think somebody is not trustworthy. We wouldn't have put them in that office if we didn't think they were trustworthy. It's to protect them from someone thinking that they are doing something inappropriate or wrong. Uh, some kind of audit should always be done when you change treasurers and change financial secretaries so that you're giving a clean set of books and you're dismissing the person who's been in service that those all those records are, are good and we have no reason to suspect anything funny happened, right? That, that protects the person. It also, of course, at the same time, protects the church's assets, which have been given and entrusted to us to be utilized in a certain way. And if you want to see your giving fall by 40 or 50 percent, just have one small case of embezzlement, malfeasance, or inappropriate spending of money and watch what happens to your giving and how many years it will take to get it back. Um, so that's that's why this matters. But if somebody says, why are you auditing me? You don't trust me? Why are you putting another person with me? You know, no, we do trust you. You wouldn't be doing this job if we didn't trust you. This is to protect you from anybody thinking you're doing anything funny, right? We, we don't want somebody to think that Bertha, after she counts that Sunday school offering, and takes it to the bank on Monday, uh, would use a quarter out of that for her parking meter, right? The, the, that's all good. It's all there the way it's supposed to be. That protects Bertha. Right. Um, and uh, and it protects the church. So this financial policy stuff matters. It, it feels complicated. Most of it's common sense. Um, regular reporting and transparency and that telling people what you're doing with the money they've given you um, makes them want to give you more if you're doing good things with it. Right. Um, and uh, being able to account for it tells them that this is a good place for me to be investing for impact in the world. That it that it's efficiently and appropriately used. Don, that's that's a quick summary of the last thirty minutes of the presentation. 
there are all kinds of other policies you can consider, and they'll be in the slides when you get them. Thank you, uh, Bruce, for your time, and um, thank you for this presentation of, 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 of how uh, to go about doing things appropriately and efficiently um, and things that protect. Uh, and, and as you said, I think, you know, builds trust or keeps trust, um, strengthens trust so that generosity flows through. Um, so I want to thank you. I want to thank everyone that was in on the webinar. Uh, as, as Bruce gives me the PowerPoints and the questions and the resources, I will be emailing them out to everyone. And uh, we will take this uh, webinar and we will place it so that maybe you can sit down with your church leaders or your congregation or your elders or whomever and go through it again, along with the PowerPoint. So thank you all for spending your Saturday mornings with us. Thank you. I hope it was helpful.